Steve are in listen only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to our third Friday lunch seminar on Brassica insect pest management. Um, just a few things to note. Um, this is a project that was funded by Northeast SARE Research and Education Grant, um, bringing together extension researchers in New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts. Um, so for today's webinar, you will be muted, but you can submit questions at any point using the questions box that is on the right hand side panel. Um, and you can sort of toggle that panel open and close using the orange arrow key. Um, if you have any trouble, try logging out and then logging back in again. Um, that seems to fix a lot of glitchy problems. Um, and today's presentation will be recorded and we're going to post them up on our website soon. So that's sort of our uh, housekeeping details. Again, feel free to submit questions at any time. So today we're going to be hearing from Anna Legrand at UConn, who is going to talk about um, cross-striped cabbage worm and salt marsh caterpillar and a few others. Thanks, Anna. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's great to be here to share with you some information about important caterpillars that we observe on brassica crops. And I want to follow up on some of the topics that Dan Gilray presented last week, also dealing with caterpillar pests in brassicas. We have a number of them to be concerned about um, that we observe is the diamond bat moth. We have also the cabbage looper, the imported cabbage worm, the cross-striped cabbage worm, and others that may occur once in a while. And last week we heard um, really good information about the diamondback moth and the cabbage looper, two very important uh, pests in brassicas. Today I want to continue looking at the other caterpillars and discuss a little bit about their biology identification. And towards the end, I want to go over some of the management practices that we can recommend. So just to quickly review, uh, the diamondback moth one was one pest discussed last week. You can see it here. It's a, a small green caterpillar that um, it's very severe in terms of the damage it can cause. We see here um, it's prepupa, a very interesting stage enclosed in a loosely webbed cocoon. And the other caterpillar you heard about last week was the cabbage looper, which you observe here with very noticeable um, way of moving by looping. And it's a very typical characteristic we can follow uh, for identification. The one shown in the screen is a, is a young caterpillar, but they can grow to a much larger size. Now for today, I want to cover the imported cabbage worm. That's a another very common pest in brassicas is probably one of our most common uh, caterpillars. And it's uh, really quickly observed when you notice white cabbage butterflies uh, flying about the fields. That's uh, our first sign to be on the lookout for this particular uh, pest. The white cabbage butterfly is, um, can be easily identified. And I will show you some uh, pictures of this in a moment. The caterpillars are very prominent in a number of brassica crops, but more particularly, we have uh, crops like cabbage, collards, Brussels sprouts, and broccoli will be more susceptible to attack by this pest in comparison to Chinese cabbage, turnip, and kale, for example. Not only brassica crops are attacked, but we can observe this uh, pest on flowers like nasturtium and sweet alyssum as well. And another point to make is that the caterpillars can also be found feeding on a number of brassica weeds like pepperweed and wild mustard. So it will be very important to uh, make sure that you observe what uh, kinds of insects are found on weeds near the fields. Here we see some of the typical damage caused by this uh, cabbage worm. And obviously in this case, it's quite severe. 
and it's um, a prominent in terms of the leaf feeding, but another problem will be uh, the frass or excrement that the caterpillars will produce as they feed that could produce contamination in the produce. So very important pest um, from that regard as well. Now the imported cabbage worm in the caterpillar stage, it's easy to recognize. The um, caterpillar is velvety green and it has a faint yellow stripe running lengthwise of its body. And the um, caterpillar tends to be slow moving in comparison with other um, brassica pests like the diamondback moth caterpillar. For the imported cabbage worm, we're going to find adults appearing around um, in early May. And in general, we may observe three to four generations per year. Once the females are ready to oviposit, they can um, likely produce 300 to 400 eggs. So their fecundity is quite prominent. And this particular pest can overwinter as a pupa or chrysalis. And that's something that will be usually attached to the debris of the brassica crops. Here you can see the imported cabbage worm butterfly. This is the adult stage. And just some hits, hints about its recognition. It's a, a white butterfly that has a number of black spots and um, black areas near the tip of the wings. When you see the butterfly from above, it will be easy to spot those black um, areas and, and spots. While the butterfly is at rest with the wings held up, it will be observed more with a yellowish color. And that's something to notice that on the underside of the wings, the yellowish creamish color will, um, will be more prominent. So just make sure don't get confused with that. Um, it's the same insect, it's just, Depending on how you look at it, you may or may not see uh, the black spots on the white background. Now, an important uh, point to mention, too, is that you may observe differences between females and males. Uh, the female uh, butterfly has a um, couple of additional spots on the first pair of wings in comparison to the males. And you can see this nicely in the lower right corner of the slide where there is a setup of two adults a pair next to each other. Now these adults, um, the females, will be flying about readily or depositing or laying eggs on the undersurface of the plants. And here you can see one such egg. Typically they lay singly on the underside and therefore it's very important for you to always, um, when you're checking, um, for these eggs on plants, always look under because that's the most likely place to, to be where you will find them. And the eggs tend to have a bullet shape shape. They're very small, but with good practice, you probably could see them um, on the surface of the leaf. A close up will show them to be like this. You can see here they're um, very particular in how they look and in this case, you can see some of the glue that the female use for attachment. Again, they're laid singly on the lower surfaces of, of the leaves. And it's quite interesting uh, to see the butterflies uh, doing this. It takes them a fraction of a second to go from plant to plant, depositing these eggs uh, as they fly about. Now, just to review again another characteristic other characteristics for the identification of the caterpillar. You can see here a, a more a fully mature uh, larva or caterpillar in, with a blue arrow indicating that yellow uh, stripe that runs along the body. It's very faint. And again, the caterpillar is, is velvety, um, very soft green, and it will be moving relatively slow in comparison to some other caterpillars that we see. When the caterpillar is more younger, um, it may appear a little bit more light green, and it will be a little bit more difficult to see that yellow stripe. But as they mature, it will become uh, more obvious. Now, after the caterpillar reaches its 
full development, it will make a pupa, which you can see here is very typical for this pest. Um, it's unique in shape, having uh, some spike uh, prominences around uh, the edges. Um, when it's recently developed, it's greenish in color. And as the butterfly is developing within and it gets ready to close, you could actually see um, the very faint wing colors through the surface of the pupa. Um, you can make out the uh, yellow or whitish wings and you will know that it's closer to emerge at that point. Now, imported cabbage worm uh, has a number of natural enemies that uh, can assist us in some natural control. Um, there's a number of general insect predators like surfeit or hoverflies. They can feed on the eggs of the uh, cutter of this particular pest. There are um, ambush and spine soldier bugs that can also feed on the caterpillars. And vespid wasps are predators that can come in and also um, uh, feed on uh, the caterpillars on the plants. Parasitoids are another very important group of natural enemies and by far these are attributed to be the most important uh, sources of mortality for this uh, particular pest and also insectivorous birds uh, can also be helpful. Now I want to take a moment to say a little bit more about parasitoids because we have done some more research on this group and again they're very important in terms of the control they can provide. We have um, a number that have been recorded and one example here is shown in, in your screen. This is a mature imported cabbage worm larva that it's really very much dead at this point uh, as many of the parasites inside are exiting. These are larvae of the Cutesia parasitoid that has been developing inside and all of them are emerging at the same time. This is one example of a parasitoid that has been released long time ago for the management of this pest. Here we see them uh, once they have formed their cocoons, they're yellowish silken uh, in texture. And you see a couple of the parasitoid adults lay next to a, a dead uh, caterpillar. And this is Cotisia glomerata, um, one caterpillar that um, um, has been found and again introduced some, some time ago. It's um, not as effective as the second example I want to give you, which is um, the Cotisia rubecula. It's a caterpillar that was released relatively more recent, and it is a better parasitoid in the sense that um, it kills the host or it kills the caterpillar at a stage, um, at a younger stage, which prevents more damage to the plants. And in this case, this particular parasitoid only lays um, one egg per host. And so you will see only one larva developing within the caterpillar and eventually exiting as uh, demonstrated by the hole that you see on the screen uh, pointed by a, by a red arrow. Um, the larva has exited this caterpillar and has produced a small whitish cocoon. And if you see these whitish cocoons, these are uh, a likely sign that it's the Cotisia rubecula parasitoid that has been um, involved in killing the caterpillar. Here you see the adult for this particular parasitoid. And again, these are small parasitoid wasps. They're going to really be um, targeting only the caterpillars and they're not um, going to harm plants or people in any way. Now, in addition to caterpillar parasitoids, we also observe some parasitoids that attack other stages of the pest, such as the pupal stage. And in this photograph, you see Enteromalus piparum. This is a very small parasitoid that attacks um, the pupal stage, and it gets um, a number of them to be developed inside the pupa. They are going to transform the pupa into a brownish color as demonstrated in this, in this picture. And um, that's a, sometimes a sign that you could use to notice whether the pupae may be parasitized or not. These are very small parasitoids that tend to be uh, metallic in, in color. 
And a second pupal parasitoid that we observed in our area is a tachinid parasitoid. It's a, this is a type of fly that also will lay its egg in the pupa and it will develop there, creating its own uh, puparium case, as you can see here on the lower corner of the photograph. And this um, is formed after the uh, larva completes its development within the imported cabbage worm pupa. All right, so there were a number of parasitoids that um, I've been able to show you and some hints in terms of how to identify some uh, members of this group of the imported cabbage worm. I'll be speaking about another um, uh, caterpillar pest in Brassicas, but before we do that, since we've been talking about a number of caterpillars uh, from last week and this week as well, we wanted just to know from you um, sort of what crops are, are, are you having more difficulty in terms of managing caterpillars. And we're going to be launching an audience poll to get some back uh, information from you. So we are um, going to um, give you some time so you can uh, please answer whether you observe problems in cabbage, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale and collards, or whether you really see in the problems um, in the same rate in any crop. Great, so it looks like about half of people have voted so far. I'll give you a few more seconds here. Okay, so it looks like people have, uh, about a quarter of people said cabbage, um, kale and collards were pretty high, and uh, a lot of folks also said about the same in any crop. So thank okay, you. thank you very much for, for your responses, and um, it will be helpful for us too to consider you uh, for future research efforts and another information that we can deliver to you. All right, the next uh, pest I want to cover is the cross-tripe cabbage worm. This is uh, an interesting uh, case because it had been a pest more prominent in southern locations in the country. And um, until recently, it hadn't really been um, documented as a severe pest. Um, Dr. Stoner in Connecticut had documented it uh, a while ago uh, becoming a, a big problem in Eastern Connecticut, and nowadays uh, we really observe it or is uh, observed as a significant uh, pest in other states like Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts. So it's um, a relatively um, newer addition to um, the um, pest in Brassicas, and it's one that we may observe to be more abundant late in the season, um, uh, but still could be present uh, th throughout the, the, the whole time. It's more problematic in crops like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and collards in comparison to uh, crops like cabbage and, and kale. The adult for this particular uh, caterpillar you see shown in, in the screen, it's uh, a brownish moth. It's uh, nothing too distinctive about it except that it's, um, it's got these wiggly lines running uh, transversely through its wings and it's got brown patches towards the tips and it has a very um, typical triangular uh, form. It's uh, active at night, and this particular moth will be laying uh, sets of eggs that you can see in this next slide. Their eggs are very characteristic because it's a cluster that appears to be more like um, a set of um, scales, but on close inspection, you will see their actual eggs, and it, they could reach up to about 25 eggs um, per cluster. They are very flat in appearance, and so care has to be taken to really uh, look for them. And out of those batches of eggs, you um, will have a number of caterpillars hatching, and this is one of the key problems with the cross-striped cabbage worm, is that unlike other uh, brassica caterpillars, you're having uh, these clusters of eggs leading to the development of um, a high number of caterpillars per plant. 
and once they start feeding, they can be quite damaging on, on the plants. The caterpillars, when they're fully mature, can reach up to three quarters of an inch. And when they're ready, they will uh, pupate uh, near the soil surface. And we may observe two to three generations uh, per year of this pest. Now, here it's uh, some illustrations uh, in the development of this cross-tripe cabbage worm. You see a very young caterpillar um, that um, exhibits a very important feature that as they are young, they may, to, they may be more yellowish with some uh, prominent black tubercles or little black bumps on the surface of their body. As they grow, they may start to change in, in the coloration a little bit. And you can observe this here, where as they're maturing, um, you will uh, see the more obvious uh, stripes that run across their bodies. And this is the more typical uh, way we can uh, recognize them. You have um, a more mature caterpillar here on the lower corner of the slide. and you see the typical uh, stripes running across with those black tubercles or little uh, shiny black bumps that are typical of them. Another feature to notice is that they have a yellow stripe uh, running along its body on each side. And that's um, another important feature to, to keep in mind. They have an orangish um, head capsule and that's also shown in these caterpillars in the center. Uh, of the photograph. Now, when they're fully mature, um, you can see them here uh, really doing extensive damage and the prominent uh, yellow lines along the body are better well developed and also um, a more darker black uh, stripe is also well developed on the side. And these caterpillars will pupate and the pupa will be found also in the soil surface. This is uh, one example of what we fear with these caterpillars is their um, potential for damage. As you have clusters of them feeding on plants, uh, their damage is extensive and very often one might see one plant totally um, being eaten up by them while neighboring plants um, have not suffered any damage. And again, really, this is due to the, the fact that uh, the females are laying these clusters of eggs that can start um, uh, an infestation very quickly on, on the single plants that they have uh, oviposited on. And once they really are done with their feeding, this is the result. You can see a tremendous damage caused by uh, the mature caterpillars. This is some broccoli where they have done extensive damage. And obviously we want to be able to prevent uh, this situation. Now, this caterpillar has also some natural enemies. Many of the general predators I mentioned earlier um, have, have been observed feeding on it, but they also have very distinct types of parasitoids that can attack them. Uh, for the cross-tripe cabbage worm, we don't see um, as many as um, the previous example of the imported cabbage worm, but we do have records of one, uh, the Cotisia orobenae. This is a small parasitoid that will attack the caterpillar and produce a number of uh, small parasitoid wasps after they have completed their development inside the larva. And here you can see a cluster of the silken cocoons that are produced by the uh, larvae of the parasitoid. And um, obviously at this point, the caterpillar has been all uh, consumed from within and it will not be able to reproduce. These are small uh, wasps and much research uh, still needs to be done on understanding better um, what role they can play in terms of providing control for the cross-striped cabbage worm. But we do have them in, um, in Connecticut and in other states as well. Now, to 
complete my review of the cross stripe cabbage worm, I just want to leave you with this photo and just ask you a question um, in terms of what you're seeing here. Um, it's a small quiz, I guess. And uh, you see the cross stripe cabbage worm, but as often we find with many of the brassica caterpillars, there's not just an infestation of one, but there are multiple species occurring on the plants. And um, you don't have to answer this through any polls, but just for your sake. Um, um, wondering if you can figure out what it's within this um, yellow uh, circle. I'll give you a second to look at it. And that's probably, if you guess, is the diamondback moth pupa. That's correct. That's um, a pupa of the diamondback moth enclosed in that silken uh, cocoon that it produces. And just neighboring the cross-stripe uh, cabbage worm larva. All right. So. Let me move on uh, to the last um, caterpillar I wanted to review. And this is one that is um, not as much of a common pest, but it's still its occurrence has been noticeable more and more recently. And this is the Sol March caterpillar. This is a caterpillar that's very common throughout the United States. It's, um, it's abundant in a number of systems and really has been described as a very serious pest in southwestern states. And nowadays we see some, some cases of it um, in Connecticut and in neighboring states as well. It's a caterpillar has a broad host range. It typically will be found feeding on a number of broadleaf weeds like pigweed. That's a primary weed that it will uh, be feeding on, but many others as well. And it's one caterpillar that will disperse to vegetables and field crops late in the season. And one might find it feeding on vegetables like asparagus, beans, tomato, and so on, including also um, some brassica crops. So it's really, um, unlike all the examples we discussed before, this one can feed on, on many uh, types of plants. And it really has an interesting story because um, the name really does not tell you much about its food habits. Uh, the salt marsh caterpillar was given this name due to earlier observations that um, the caterpillar was found feeding on salt grass hay in the Boston area. However, um, grasses are really not of a particular liking for this uh, insect, so it's a uh, mismatch in terms of, of the naming. However, uh, again, it's something that we, you may observe in some vegetables, including some brassicas. It's a little tricky to identify because it comes on a number of color forms. Um, on this slide, you see at least three of them. It's a very hairy caterpillar, and it may come in a yellowish cream uh, color, as shown on the top corner here with this um, red arrow. You may also find them more in the uh, orangish uh, brown or a grayish brown. And there is one more form that is not shown, which is a darker brown uh, caterpillar. However, all of them do share the fact that they are uh, very hairy, as you can see here. And another important feature to use for distinguishing them is their uh, dark or black head capsule that they have and this is indicated by that red arrow and that capsule or head also has a light yellow uh, or a light color um, streak or line uh, running um, in the middle so that will be another feature you could use to tell them apart from other similarly looking caterpillars like the yellow woolly bear, which may be very uh, similarly looking due to the hairiness of it. The adult for this um, insect is shown below, and it's a beautiful moth. It's uh, distinguished by uh, a white uh, set of wings with uh, black spots, and a feature that is um, uh, pointed here in this uh, photograph is the fact that males have yellowish, uh, orangish uh, wings uh, for the second pair of wings that you can observe. So that's one feature to tell females and, and males apart. 
So there you have, uh, this is the salt marsh uh, caterpillar, um, something that you may observe uh, later in the season as they're moving uh, around finding new host plants, um, not just on brassica, but you may observe it on other crops as well. The females um, can produce uh, uh, large clusters of eggs, and this photograph shows you uh, one such couple of such clusters and indicated by that uh, red arrow. You see a, a, a female adult here and from this you will have a, a number of uh, the larvae moving about uh, for finding their food. All right, so one question we wanted to give to you um, just to get more feedback in terms of the cross-striped cabbage worm and also the salt marsh caterpillar, do want to ask you about whether you have noticed a trend of uh, more problems with these particular pests in recent years. So please, uh, through a poll, uh, let us know whether you're not seeing any problems, whether it's just with one type of pest or both, or if you're not sure, we'll also be happy to know that. Thank you. And the poll will be opening now. Yeah, it looks like actually most people have cast their vote. I'll just wait a few more seconds. Great. So let's see. Kind of across the board, 17% uh, said not notice an increase. 28% said yes to cross white cabbage worm. 10% yes, salt marsh caterpillar. 17% both caterpillars increasing and 28% not sure. Okay, thank you for sharing those replies with us. And uh, it's important to know because one question we have is uh, how different pests may be changing the ranges or maybe changing habits so that we, um, some of them like the cross stripe or salt marsh are becoming more of a, a, a problem. So we want to keep track of this. And if any uh, anybody wants to share more information with the, uh, with the group, we'll be happy to, to hear from you. Now, I want to continue quickly for time's sake on to um, other aspects of this uh, presentation. And we review some items related to the identification and biology of these uh, caterpillars. Let us talk about uh, some of the management aspects now. And one of the key messages is that as we look for options, we need to um, integrate all possible uh, tools that we have at our hands to make a comprehensive package that will help us in lower uh, the numbers of these pest populations. And so I want to pick up on what Dan Gilray Gilrain had mentioned last week, giving us a very nice overview of uh, different IPM tools for the diamondback moth and also for the cabbage looper. So really I'll be uh, restating some of those uh, tips and also adding uh, a new pieces of information um, more relevant to the pest we have discussed today. Now, some of the management actions we suggest in terms of these uh, caterpillars is to uh, be mindful of where you set your crops because we know that many of these caterpillars are going to be uh, overwintering in uh, either crop residues or nearby areas where they can find uh, protective habitat. So it is good to, if possible, to try to avoid um, planting in uh, areas where there has been severe infestations uh, previously. And another very important point is that, I, as already told you, many of these caterpillars can use brassica weeds as an alternative host. And so those weeds could potentially act as reservoirs for them. So we want to make sure that um, weeds like yellow rocket, wild mustard, shepherd's purse, and other in the brassica family are managed and are not made readily available for, for these insects. So um, you're making sure that you have good control of them will be important. And as you can see in the photograph on the bottom of the slide, you may have a, a planting area and in the neighboring locations, you could have um, just wild vegetation 
and if that contains many of these brassica weeds that potentially could be acting as a reservoir for these pests. So um, it's good to monitor those areas, making sure that um, you don't have plants there that uh, will be um, providing just more food for the uh, caterpillars. Now, Another uh, aspect to cover, and that was mentioned also last week for the other brassica caterpillars, was the use of row covers. Potentially, this is a very good tool that can prevent the entry so that the insect cannot lay eggs on the plants. And if they are set out early enough and they are well um, put in place, that could give you a good protection uh, from um, the, the, the uh, adults uh, laying eggs on the plants. The key though is to be mindful of um, how you're going to manage weeds um, once the covers are on and also that once the covers are in place that you have a very tight seal um, so that insects cannot just make their entryway through gaps that are left open. Now Another point for uh, management, or at least to help prevent uh, higher occurrences of this pest, will be uh, to act in terms of uh, conserving natural enemies. And we have seen that there are a number of uh, parasitoids that can provide some assistance, um, and also a number of predators. So we usually like to suggest that um, giving them a little bit of a hand will be useful. Many of these parasitoids require nectar and pollen for uh, their survival and to increase their fecundity. So um, adding plants that can provide those resources can be useful. The point I wanna make though is we know quite a bit about uh, the benefits that these beneficial insects receive from uh, provision of nectar and pollen. In the case for uh, the system involving caterpillar um, pests in brassicas, we still need to figure out a little better whether we can see increments of um, parasitism or increments of attack um, for the caterpillars from the parasitoids. So that's something that we are currently researching and hope to give some answers in the near future. But in the meantime, we do know that the plants can provide um, these benefits in terms of increased fecundity and survival. So if the option is available to um, include them through other means, that, that will be great. Uh, for example, uh, the inclusion of hedgerows can be a good aspect in terms of uh, having an ability to include uh, flowering plants that provide these uh, resources. Some growers may be interested in adding pollinator habitat to their farms, and this may be giving another opportunity where plants that can uh, serve beneficial insects like the parasitoids uh, could be also included. Also, we might find situations where herbs or pot flowers are being grown as part of the regular farm operations. And if selected carefully, that may be another opportunity where you may be able to include some of the plants that uh, provide benefits to beneficials. And lastly, also using uh, cover crops, um, it may be a situation where a cover crop is in place and if one can select um, a plant that has flowers like buckwheat or phacelia, that may be an, a good opportunity uh, to provide benefits to the beneficial insects uh, while meeting another need of the farming operation. So there are different ways that we might consider um, the inclusion of um, these resources that can assist in the conservation of natural enemies. And so those are some tips in terms of um, things to uh, think about in terms of prevention and assisting uh, forms of natural control. Let me move quickly to um, making a, another point in terms of uh, the monitoring aspect for this pest. We want to make sure that um, their presence is um, detected as early as possible. So scouting weekly will be important and noting what species are, are being uh, found. And the purpose of the scouting is really to have the information so that 
one can make decisions about other management activities. And for that purpose, we um, have what we call action thresholds. These are levels that we can use so we can make a decision about the application of insecticide or some other um, uh, pest uh, control material that you could use. And we have recommendations in terms of uh, thresholds for cabbage looper, diamond bat moth, and imported cabbage worm. And you see uh, there are different levels that have been suggested. Uh, for example, uh, in, in general, you will want to take some action if you're reaching 35% infestations before heading the heading stage in the crop. And for cabbage, broccoli, uh, for example, from the start of heading to harvest, 20% uh, infestation in the plants will be um, a, a point where one will need to take some action to prevent uh, further problems. And lastly, if you're dealing with kale or colors, 10% uh, infestation level uh, throughout the season will be a level uh, to take some action, uh, again, to prevent uh, further problems. So your scouting information will be very important because this is the way you're going to gather the data so that you can use these uh, thresholds and make uh, decisions um, about the, uh, the management timing. And also, the other pest that we discussed today was the cross-striped cabbage worm. And for this one, uh, the action threshold is a little different. We have one a suggestion of 5% infestation. Uh, that's um, a point where action has to be taken. And this is an important point to make because this pest, as you have seen, can be quite damaging. And since they occur in, in higher numbers per plant, will be good to prevent um, their development into more mature caterpillars that can uh, cause more serious problems. Now, once uh, a decision is made to take some action, uh, there are a number of tools available for this. And we like to suggest the use of selective insecticides primarily to pr protect uh, beneficial insects. And, uh, some suggestions within this group are listed here. Um, one of them that's very common as a tool for um, uh, caterpillars of different types is Bacillus syringiensis, or for short, Bt. Bt, it's a, a very well-known uh, biopesticide, and it's uh, one of the most common in use. We have two different types, uh, the subspecies Korstaki and subspecies Aizawe, and they come in different commercial formulations, two of them listed here for you, Dipel and, and Shintari. This uh, BT is um, an extremely useful tool, especially for uh, growers who are looking for a biological way of, of controlling these caterpillars. One point to make is that you have to be careful in terms of trying to use it as soon as you detect them because it will be most effective on the younger caterpillars. Um, still, you will be able to have some effect on the older ones, but uh, the younger, the better in terms of when you can target them with the um, BT products. And they're very specific, so BT, um, Kurstaki, and Isawi will be only targeting uh, caterpillar pests. So that's one of the reasons why we like it, because it's really going to live along many of the other beneficials that we will want to protect uh, for natural control. Here is a graph just showing um, just briefly some um, efficacy studies uh, as it relates to some of the pests we have described being, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, cross striped cabbage worm, the diamondback moth, and the imported cabbage worm are all listed here. And you can see there are indeed a number of studies that back up um, the efficacy of BT as, as, a, as a tool for their management. Now, there are other products as well um, that are listed. Um, Espinosa or Entrust is one uh, product, is some relisted. And Chlorantraniliprol is another um, type of insecticide um, under uh, commercial uh, name of Corrigin. 
that's another uh, tool that's available as well. Um, this one, though, is not unrelisted. And, and there are many others that I'm not listing here, but you can easily find them in a number of publications. In particularly, I refer you to the Vegetable Management Guide. This is um, an excellent re reference where you can find the various insecticides and other management tips associated with each of the caterpillars that I discussed today and also that were discussed last week as well. Just a note to make uh, is that the uh, number of um, pest control materials listed for the imported cabbage worm um, it's, um, there are many of them, it's quite extensive in comparison to the ones listed for the cross-tripe cabbage worm. The number is more reduced, so uh, be careful when you are dealing with those pests. Just make sure that you identify what is a material that is listed um, for each because they are not um, having the same type of materials listed for, uh, for them. And another excellent reference is um, if for persons uh, who are looking for identification uh, for photographs information for the different pests is the Northeast Vegetable and Strawberry Pest ID Guide. Uh, this is a nice reference that's freely available on the web and you can also find it on there the same link that takes you to the North England Vegetable Management Guide. And just to uh, complete this overview, I want to leave you with a couple of the resources. The website for the um, IPM program at Yukon, it's another good uh, tool for more information on Brassica pests. And also the Brassica Pest Collaborative has set up a website where you can find more information as we come up through different research trials and other projects. We will be posting that information at this website too. Now, in terms of other uh, references, you have the Natural Enemy ID Guide, the Natural Enemy Handbook. This is an excellent book for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about natural enemies that can attack uh, the Brassica uh, caterpillars. And the book is excellent in terms of photographs and also in cost is not very expensive at all. Lastly, we have a um, couple other websites listed here. The Cornell Biocontrol website is a good reference point with more details about each uh, type of natural enemy. And the Yukon IPM website has uh, very nice uh, publications in terms of um, identification of natural enemies as well. And with that, I have completed this overview. Um, we have now time to uh, take your questions or deal with any other aspects uh, related to the Brassica caterpillars that you will be curious about. Great. Thank you, Anna, so much for that uh, excellent presentation. You can tell that you have a lot of experience with the conservation biocontrol and all the parasitoids and predators and um, wondering that's something that's come up now a few times and if you could just list maybe quickly a few flowers that you would recommend to attract some of those uh, parasitic wasps and um, yeah, the recommendations about that. Yes, uh, there are a number of, of, uh, of flowers that have been researched. Uh, in general, we see um, plants in the aster family and the carob family as being excellent, um, what we call insectary plants. Those plants that provide nectar and pollen for a number of beneficial insects. So many members of those families are, are pretty good selections. Um, for example, uh, plants that one can use with double benefits will be things like um, cilantro or uh, fennel, for example. Those are uh, plants that people may grow as a herb or for other purposes. And you can, if you let them flower, also uh, get the benefit of providing nectar for, for beneficials. Um, in, there are many plants in the aster family as well that one can uh, also make use. We have been researching uh, one plant, Ami Mahus, um, as a plant that attracts uh, all kinds of um, beneficials, and we have documented that many families of uh, parasitoids do come to it. So 
we want to explore more uh, the benefits of using this plant because of the high diversity of beneficials that it can attract. Great, yeah, and we actually planted that on your recommendation this year um, in our cabbage aphid insectary experiment, and um, that the Ami Magus or Ami Magus uh, Queen Anne's lace it attracted a ton of the Diarotelia rapi, which is the native uh, parasitoid that attacks cabbage aphids. So that was interesting, and I definitely plants it again in my cabbage aphid. Yeah, we, we have um, collected also parasitoids uh, from um, the cabbage experiments we have been doing. Uh, we have observed Cotesia coming to the AMI also, um, and a number of also, like you mentioned, surfeits are also showing up uh, to feed on it. And when one goal as you as persons select uh, different insectary plants is just to try to pick something that uh, will be attractive of a, a good diversity of, of beneficials because um, you know there the more different types that you can attract um, I think you will multiply the benefits not just for uh, the caterpillars but for other pests that may be found in the crop okay great um Something, oh, something else that you mentioned that I've been curious about before is um, that some birds will uh, feed on caterpillars. And do you know if there are specific species of bird that are better to um, at, at eating pest caterpillars? And also, are there ones that are easier to lure into your brassica field, like with bird boxes or some other habitat? Um. I do not know any specific species. Um, I might defer that to other members of the panel if they have other information about that. But I know that having a habitat that promotes, um, you know, nesting habitat for birds uh, or structures like uh, nesting boxes, um, that probably would be a good idea in terms of um, attracting more of the birds that, um, uh, you know, could feed on these uh, caterpillars. I don't know if anybody else will have anything else to add on a particular species or any studies that have been done. Oh, this is Dan. Um, there are some studies done uh, being done right now. Um, there's a graduate student uh, in entomology who was reporting on some of her results at a recent meeting. Uh, and definitely there's uh, some species that seem to utilize a higher proportion of these caterpillars in their diets. Um, whether they'll uh, actually forage within a crop or not is a good question. I don't know uh, the answer to that. Um, but I know some of the results of her work will be coming out and then um, uh, it would be good to find out if uh, some of those observations were made within agricultural type settings. And I, I don't have the answer to that. But there's definitely differences uh, among bird species in the insects, uh, proportions of kinds of insects used in their diets. I think chickadees and wrens were among the ones that used a lot of leps, but all of them seemed to, that she was reporting on, seemed to use um, caterpillars, uh, at least the ones she discussed. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, um, another thing that you mentioned with the cross-striped cabbage wormana was um, that it seemed to prefer some crops over others. And in other, with other brassica insect pests like flea beetles, we um, can use host preference um, to set up like trap crops. And I wonder if that is something that is relevant with any of the caterpillar species. There have been done some studies on trap crops. Um, one of the, some sets of results I'm more familiar with are those for the diamondback moth, where they have looked not really at using other crops, but using um, um, other plants um, like uh, yellow rocket. Um, that has been one that they have done studies in and uh, showing to be promising in terms of um, the use as a trap crop for the diamondback moth. You have to consider that um, what they suggest is that you need a 20% of the area dedicated to that trap crop uh, for some efficacy to, to be present. So that's um, one item, and also that it's it will 
as at the moment as we understand it, it will be specific just to the diamondback moth. Uh, will not really, um, as far as I know, not I know I do not know of any results that address the other caterpillar uh, problems. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions about sort of spray related. Um, one is, uh, we've talked a lot about BT in the last two webinars that were focusing on these caterpillars. So what kind of shelf life does Dipel or the other BT products have? Is it similar to other pesticides or shorter? Um, a lot has to do with the formulation. Um, the, the type of formulation of BT will dictate um, the, sh the shelf life. Um, right now, I, I might defer to other members of the panel if they have more specific information about the timing. Um, I'm just very familiar with differences as related to a formulation, whether it's um, uh, more of a granular form uh, as compared to an oil uh, type of form. Um, but there are indeed differences, um, and it may be, uh, in comparison to other materials, it may be shorter because um, Bacillus thuringiensis is, is um, it's a product, it's a bacterial uh, material, so it, you know, will only have s some amount of activity. But I wonder if the, there's anybody in the panel who could add more in terms of the timing, a more specific timing for shelf life. Mm -hmm. My understanding from speaking with companies that manufacture this product, these products, is to count on about a year. And okay. so if you were to purchase material, use it within the year and buy new for the coming year. And keep in mind, these BT materials really are, um, you're not dealing for the most part with a live organism doing the control. It's a kind of a, a protein crystal or endotoxin that is a... Um, really doing most of the action providing control of the caterpillars so that's the that's what it's what's going on okay thanks um, so maybe just some pointers for um, using BT most effectively we talked about catching the pests early before they've gotten too big and so that gets back to the point of scouting regularly um, and also just knowing when they might show up. So we've gone over that now the last two weeks. So scout often, keep up with the sprays. And uh, last time we talked about using wetting agents to help improve coverage. And there were questions about OMRI approved wetting agents. And Dan, I wonder if you could um, say a little bit more about the different wetting agents. Yeah, uh, someone had asked about which ones were available. Um, and Omri certainly has a list of some. Um, certain products like Brandt uh, Consolidated makes some or remarkets some. There's one called 719. There's a super wetter. They have a product called Brandt Organics Eco Spreader, which is uh, the same apparently as the former Green Cypress Eco Spreader. Um, they have one called Ag Aid um, and one called SKH Sticker. Um, and there's other products on the market too. There's one from derived from Yucca called Thermex 70 and Hydromax. So these are other products. Uh, Thur uh, New Film is in one. Another one that is um, used. This is uh, uh, basically a sticker. Uh, these adjuvants are designed to do different things. And uh, when you're dealing with brassicas, you're dealing with a waxy leaved uh, crop. Often the leaves are somewhat vertical, and so getting things to remain on a vertical leaf that's waxy, as you can imagine, can be a challenge. Um, so obviously you want things that help improve wetting uh, and sticking sometimes too. Uh, not always sticking necessary, but sometimes that's helpful. Uh, you don't want something that has too much uh, runoff, so you don't want the surface temp to be lowered too excessively. So you don't want to use excessive rates of any of these materials that might increase the runoff beyond what you would want. You want at least some of this residue remaining on the foliage. Um, some of these materials are also active to help improve penetration into the, into the leaves. Um, so for material specifically, I'm thinking in trust as some possible translaminar activity, maybe not so necessary in brassicas, but maybe where you're dealing with leaf miners or where maybe you want a little more persistence. Uh, you might choose a material that uh, has some penetrating um, activity. 
uh, MPED and other insecticidal soaps and uh, uh, some of the horticultural oils can also be useful as adjuvants. And whenever you're going to use any of these, I would say try a low rate, maybe even go much lower than the label suggests. Uh, for example, with MPED, even a half a percent or quarter percent sometimes works well. Um, and then add more if you think the wetting is not enough, if, you do, if it seems to be rolling off. So start with a lower rate uh, once you've chosen one and increase it to where you think uh, you're getting the best kind of wetting and not too much. Okay, great. Thanks. And I guess that's all the time that we have today. Thanks everybody who tuned in and for sharing your questions with us. And thanks, Anna, for the presentation. And we will see you guys next week for a discussion of cabbage root maggot. So see you then. Thanks.